One martial arts super secret technique is another style's yellow belt material. Hello and welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 322. Today, I'm joined by Grandmaster Joe Rebello, also known as Kenpo Joe. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick. I'm your host for this show, and I am excited because it's another great day in the world of the martial arts of, for being a traditional martial artist because there's more and more great stuff out there for you. And I don't just mean products. We've had products for years, but there are more and more people out there producing amazing content, whether that's on YouTube or on social media or podcasts. I just, I, I love it. We've got great books. And I don't mean we as in Whistlekick's making all this. I just mean that the world is producing more and more wonderful martial arts content, which makes me excited and proud to be a traditional martial artist. Hopefully you feel the same. If you want to follow everything we've got going on, head on over to whistlekick.com and you can find links to all of our projects, all of our products. And if you want to find the show notes for this or any other episode, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find photos, videos, plenty of links pretty much anything you could imagine to give more context, more insight, not only to the episodes that we do, but to the guests, to the people that really make this show what it is, because it's not me. It's all these wonderful people who agree to share their time with me and by extension with all of you. Thank you to all of them. Let's talk about today's guest. Grandmaster Joe Rubello is a fixture at martial arts events throughout the country. I've seen him. If you've been to Sifu Allen Goldberg's event in New Jersey, you've probably seen him there. If you've been to the Gathering of Eagles, the Kempo event that was held recently in Texas, you've seen him. He has a television show, a legitimate television show. It actually airs on TV about martial arts. And he's bringing that show and a lot of old episodes to YouTube. And we're, of course, going to have links to all that in the show notes. But this man, this is a funny man. This is an entertaining man, made even more compelling by the fact that he loves martial arts on a level that few of us can truly claim. And that made for a great conversation. I was thoroughly engaged and entertained, and I hope all of you are too. So let's step back and welcome Grandmaster Joe Rubello. Grandmaster Rubello, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Greetings and felicitations, Jeremy. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Of course. I'm honored to have you on the show. Solicitations. Does that, does that mean you're going to sell me something? No, felicitations, not solicitations. <laughs> F-E, like, uh, you know, uh, Feliz Navidad and ah, Felicity and, yeah. you know, felicitations. No, yes. No, I got you. That makes far more sense. Jeremy, you need to get out more. What am I going to do with you? You know, I really, I really do. <laughs> I, am, I am stuck in in this this small space talking to people not not quite every day but certainly every week and and doing a lot of email and as as i used to tell people they'd say so what do you do and i would say i do a lot of social media in my pajamas that was that was my job description for the first couple of years as we as we built this thing so. for me it was well what do you do for a living well i do martial arts and they say yeah but what do you do for a living and i go i do martial arts and then I was, <laughs> you know it, it's so interesting. You've probably seen the, the social media, the, the memes, what I think I do, what my parents think I do, what my friends think I do, you know, the, the four or five panels. And the martial arts ones are always so spot on because the, the variance between what people actually think that we do as martial artists and what we do, it's, it's so dramatically different, isn't it? Oh, well, you know, it's funny you mention that. There's always the classic phrases, you know, you have a person, go drop in the stance and Wah! And I normally say, you know, are you into medication for that? Or, uh, you know, preparation H will work wonders for that. You really should invest in some. Uh, yeah, I, or, or I don't want to meet you in a dark alley. Well, what are you doing in dark alleys? Or should I even ask to begin with? You know? So I, I definitely have built up a, quite, a, quite a plethora of responses to the, the classic uh, reactions from individuals who aren't in the martial arts and uh you know i i'm very fortunate i do what i love i love what i do and i do it for a living how many people in life can really say that not many not too many yeah. what do you do 
How do you, let, let me ask the question a little bit differently than, than others may. How do you earn money? Okay. Well, um, I run a martial arts studio. I've been, oh, let's see, October 3rd, 2018, we'll make 50 years in the martial arts and 40 years teaching. And uh, I've been, uh, I've got black belt or instructor certification in Chinese, Okinawan, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, and American martial arts. Um, last time I looked, I've done over 60 martial arts in my life. We, we, we I added it up the other day with them because someone was asking a little while ago, how many arts have you actually physically done? Um, but that's how I make my living. That's what I do for a job. I, I teach martial arts. Um, uh, I also have uh, two television programs, uh, Martial Arts Today TV and uh, Rebellious Kempo Karate, which air in New Bedford, Mass, and five of the major cable systems in a million households. And we also have extended exclusive episodes on YouTube. Uh, I got a real good deal with them regarding that and um, just educating the, the masses and the other martial artists to the diversity of the martial arts. So that's what I do for a job. <laughs> <laughs> and how has that changed over the 40 years that you've been teaching? Um, just learning more, learning more, growing more. Um, you know, I always have a, 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 one of the things I say, um, one martial arts super secret technique is another style's yellow belt material. You know, learning the diversity of arts and, and a lot of times by learning other arts, going back and looking at my art and going, oh, that's why we do this. And that's why we do that. And look at people in my own art who don't know that because they never studied those other arts. So therefore, they can't cross reference material. And I think that's so important and pertinent in today's um, more modern, eclectic understanding of the martial arts. You know, I mean. I, I trained with people like David German, who was one of the pioneers of MMA in this country. He did MMA before it was cool. You know, Inside Kung Fu Magazine called him the eclectic heretic. He hated that phrase, but he was. He was, he was, he was, he was one of the first people to combine it, Parker's Kempo and grappling. And I mean, to the point where it's funny, I was watching the UFCs, one of the early ones, and they had a boxer on there, and they had, he only had one glove on. And people say, well, what did he wear? You're wearing two gloves. Simple. The Gracie stole the idea from one of David German's tournaments in California, which the concept was if the guy wanted, the boxer wanted to grapple, he had a free hand, he could grab his other wrist to grab the guy's gi. If he was wearing two boxing gloves, he wasn't able to do it. Right. And to see that my instructor influenced the UFC and, you know, and, and look how that works in relationship to the diversity of the arts. And that's the key. That's what makes it fun. Nice. Now, over the past 40 years, have you seen an acceptance of that cross-training, of that, that diversity? And, and No, I guess I'll, end, I'll put oh, the question mark there. Yeah? Definitely, by all means. I mean, you know, I mean, what, what is MMA? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's two, there's, in all honesty, there's really two types of MMA. There's the MMA that we see in the UFC, mixed martial arts, which in the old days was no holds barred when it was a lot more fun. Um, but the other mixed martial arts are people who are mixing styles and make people make it sound like it's something new and radical. It's been done for centuries. It's nothing new. You know, it's only the narrow minded individuals who in their xenophobia will only stay in their one style and, and can't possibly, you know, want to go to any other style. And I look at them and I go, you know, your founder learned this art and this art and this art to put his art together. You know, the one that you want to keep pure. And I said, as Ed Parker said, you know, when pure knuckles meet pure flesh, that's about as pure as martial arts ever gets. Mm. Yeah, the, 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 the whole understanding of, of the diversity of your knowledge base and, you know, what do you want to learn? You know, how do you want to, what, what do you like that takes your system and makes it into your individual style? I always loved that from Mr. Parker as well. Kempo is a system, and from the system, you create individual styles. Well, it's not just for Kempo. It's for any given martial art if you choose to take that path. How do you reconcile that, which is an important concept, and certainly something that I, I support and believe in, and I would suggest that the majority of guests we've had on the show feel the same. How do you reconcile that with teaching something? Because, of course, you can't have a white belt walk in day one and say, do what seems right. You've got to give them some structure. So how, how do you handle that as an that, You know, it's really funny because that, that's, my, that's, my, that's my JKD argument. You know, I, I don't know if those people are unaware. Um, uh, a lot of people know me in the internet and the martial arts world as Kenpo Joe. 
And one of the, my greatest accomplishments was meeting and working and training with Ed Parker and learning American Kempo. He, he redesigned my thought process. He made me even more open-minded to various martial arts. Um, he gave me the carte blanche to say, it's okay. Um, and in regards to things like JKD and Jeet Kune Do, um, there's a whole dissertation he has in one of his books of infinite insights into Kempo, his five volume opus on his system and the martial arts in general. And he talks about Bruce Lee about that. You know, I mean, one doesn't simply become free. The classic phrase in our politically charged uh, atmosphere is that freedom isn't free. You know, people lay their lives on the line that we could be free. Everybody from uh, the original patriots in the American Revolution on down gave their lives so we could be free. You know, um, our freedom of expression, and I always cross-reference it to the Tao Te Ching. One can only see beauty as beauty only because there's ugliness. High and low rest upon each other. Long and short contrast one another. It's seeing that those contrasts to be able to appreciate what is freedom. So, you know, most of, uh, truth be told, most of Bruce Lee's top students were already black belts. You know, outside of a one guy, um, Ted, uh, Ted Wong, I think, was, was the only guy who, was, who had no previous martial arts training. The majority of his students were past martial artists in some way, shape, or form. And most of his best ones were already black belts. So they could appreciate, quote unquote, the freedom they were having from their, quote unquote, established styles and systems. So, you know, uh, to me, you got to you got to start somewhere. You have to have established curriculum and format and knowledge. And then once you achieve a particular point, you can grow above and beyond that if you so desire. And again, if you so desire. It's not always, not every, you know, there's a, a great phrase, a friend of mine uh, taught me a, a great story. He had a friend of his who literally was a rocket scientist, a nuclear physicist. And he was trying to get him involved in Mr. Parker's system. He's, and the guy basically told him, look, I think all day long. That's all I do. I think in new radical concept theories and, and principles to try to achieve new levels of understanding. This, this, this style's got too much thought process in it. So what he did, he brought him to a Shotokan dojo out in California and learned a very traditional Japanese instructor. And he was like, I love it. It's mindless. I block, I punch, I kick. That's all I have to focus on. I don't have to think about intricate theories and concepts and principles. All I have, this is a block, this is a punch, this is a strike. All I got to do is learn another kata. And he was content in that format. He was content that way. And that's what made him happy. So you know, it all, the, the, the various arts vary according to various individuals. What is freedom and how free can you be within the structure of your given system? How open-minded are you? Like Mr. Parker used to say, you know, um, the mind's like a parachute. Works best when it's open. Uh, my Aikido instructor, Jack Leonardo, had a phrase that went beyond that. He said, Joseph, it's great to have an open mind, but it's even better to have an open heart. And I understood that in relationship to the level of sincerity and really just wanting to learn and being nice and kind to people. Um, back to Ed Parker, you know, make a smile and a handshake, your best friends. And, and I always like to say some of the deadliest people I've ever met on the planet were also some of the nicest. Do you think that's an accident or do you think there, there's synergy there? I think synergy and relationship to realizing when you have the ability to take a human being's life that you appreciate life all the more. I think when you learn, as I say, the joys of Kempo, how to rip, gouge, maim, and mutilate for fun and profit, <laughs> you know, when you, when you have those skills, when, 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 again, I like quoting Mr. Parker and other instructors I've worked with. Ed Parker used to say, I look at a person the way a butcher looks at a side of beef, filet mignon, rump roast, and he's dissecting them. Why? Well, he worked as a butcher for two years. So when we as martial artists, when we're in that state, as the Japanese call of zanshin, of alertness, you know, and we're looking at a person and, you know, and we're already reading them before, before they even begin to think about throwing that punch or kick. And we know, we know before they knew because they're still in the thought process of thinking about it. We can already see it. I mean, they might as well tattoo it on their forehead. Why? Because we're aware. So that synergy of understanding, you know, the classic phrase you always hear from many martial artists, well, the first half of my life, I learned how to hurt people. Now in the second half of my life, I'm learning how to heal people. 
So many martial arts masters learn to become acupuncturists and osteopaths and doctors and, and you know, the, the, the backwoods doc with the, with the Ditta Jiao and the, the, the Asper Cream and Bengay and whatnot, Tiger Bomb. And, you know, so all these different aspects we have, we have to have that. And, you know, quote Mr. Miyagi, Pat Morita's Mr. Miyagi, Daniel san you must find balance. And if we're going to balance ourselves as human beings with the yin and yang, if we're going to balance the, the violent, you know, vicious brutality allegedly in our art with the passive, calm, tranquil, serene elements of being a thoughtful and, and uh, a benevolent human being, you know, we've got to find that balance, that happy medium, as it were. Mm. And uh, I said, I'm very fortunate that many of these, these men and women I met had that. And they were just great people to meet. They were great people to know. I was so happy and blessed to know them. I was just lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I have an inkling of what that's like. I've been pretty lucky the last few years because of the show, because of getting to speak with folks like you. Now, when you, when you look back, you know, 50 years coming up, I mean, that's, that's quite the accomplishment. So few people make it. Even a few years and those that make it, you know, five or 10 rarely go on to 50 years, I'm not hearing any, anything in your voice, in your words that make me doubt you're going to continue beyond that. But let's go, let's go the other end. Let's go back to the beginning. How did you find martial arts? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, 1968, 68, 60. Yeah, I was, I was, I was seven years old. My father and I are doing father, son, horse play. He hits me with a karate chop and drops me. Instead of crying, I look up from the ground and go, what was that? And he goes, that's karate. Well, what's karate? So he proceeded to explain he was studying with a gentleman by the name of Dave Schuster in New Bedford, Massachusetts, who ran a dojo big in uh, House of Oyama. And for those uh, martial arts trivia buffs, if you have a first edition of Masayama's This is Karate, and you look in the back of the book, and you look for schools, you will find Dave Schuster, House of Oyama, New Bedford, Massachusetts, as this Northeastern United States representative. Long before Tanamura Sensei or anybody else, he was one of the main people. Well, at that time, it was a men's club. So no women were taking karate and no kids. So my dad would teach me little things on the sly here and there that he was learning from his training in Kyokushin. And then the next year, I got to meet Masoyama. Um, again, they were doing a public demonstration at the dojo on Dartmouth Street, New Bedford. And I went to it and I got to see Dave Schuster work with uh, Masoyama. Uh, they then later did a demonstration at a military base. I'm eight years old. Like, I remember where it was. It might have been Fort Devens. It might have always been at Fort Base. I don't know. All I remember is that they had a demonstration. And at one point, he had like five, four or five um, military police officers there, MPs. And he had them hold their nightsticks in both their hands. Now, people got to realize Masoyama is known in the martial arts world as the man who killed 52 bulls with his bare hands in his lifespan. A man who basically on his kashuku, which was his intensive training, would go up in the mountains and punch the side of a tree 500 times with each hand until that bark on that tree died. So... He's got these guys holding these nightsticks, and he proceeds to snap them with shuto chops like kindling. Now, mind you, this isn't somebody in a Zenkutsu Dachi forward stance locking his elbows out, bracing a board so you can break it. These are full five guys who basically doesn't know what the heck he's going to do, and he proceeds to snap these things in half. And I'm always reminded of the scene with, um, with Jim Kelly from Enter the Dragon, where he's squaring off with the two racist police officers, and he snaps one of the night sticks with a, with a shooto chop. I saw that live. I yanked my dad's pant leg. I go, look, Superman. <laughs> so that's how it began. And then um, my first commercial school. I was at uh, St. Anthony's Elementary School. Actually, it was more of a middle school because it was seventh and eighth grade. And I met a gentleman by name of Eric Chevalier. And Eric was a student at the Fairhaven, Massachusetts, United Studios of Self-Defense. Now, Fred Villari and uh, business associate his Rudy Horn were both students under Nick Sirio. Uh, Nick Sirio relocated to Florida for a short time. And... Rudy had the money and the backing and the business savvy. Fred was a good instructor. They decided to open up a couple of martial arts schools and they were going to become Nick serial franchises. Well, Nick was down in Florida at the time. So they opened up school in Waltham and Dedham. And 
when Nixon, Nixon retired of Florida and came back to, to New England, he said, look, we've got these two schools. We want to make a Nixon real franchise. Et cetera, et cetera. He's like, why don't you tell me this? Why, why, why don't you open up, why'd you open up a school first and now tell me after you've been open for a while? So they had a big falling out. So Rudy and, uh, and Fred Valari decided to open up. A, they had two studios. So these two studios were united in a common cause, learning the same art. So he opened up United Studios of Self-Defense. Um, and later on, got some business acumen from, my, I believe, the Tracys and other sources and started franchises. So this is one of the first 20 schools he had opened when he decided to go with this franchise idea. And I was training with a gentleman by the name of Fred E. Hosmer, who preferred being called Ed Hosmer, which is ironic, Ed Hosmer, Ed Parker. It's amazing how I, I, I float in that, in those, those, those cosmic streams, as it were. But um, I, always, I always say he had, he had the blonde hair like Robert Redford. He had the tan like uh, George Hamilton. He had the physique of Bruce Lee and the flexibility of Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, he was so popular. Oh, yeah. For, for girls from the local Fairhaven High School would stop by just so they could stare, and, stare through the window and, wa- and watch Ed work out bare-chested during the summer. It was hilarious. <laughs> but um, he was a great martial artist. He was very open-minded. Um, he had gotten he, he literally had gotten his black belt in nine months. He was a merchant seaman, got out of had all this money from the military, he walked into a dojo with this guy Tom Jordan and said, I just want to train. Seven days he became a dojo rat. For nine months he trained straight and got his black belt. And then later on, you know, opened up the uh, United Studios. And um it was great because um he was a guy who was on the sly, unbeknownst to Fred Villari and the powers that be, was sneaking down to go train with Jeff Smith and Bill Superfoot Wallace. You know, that was unheard of back then, you know, going to work on kickboxing and full contact karate. But he was an open minded individual and he wanted to learn. And he was just genuinely, just one again, a genuinely nice person. And um, unbeknownst to me at that time, I didn't know, but, you know, his little 12 year old Joey, Joey, this chubby pigeon toed kid who couldn't run straight. And I was grossly pigeon toed. I did when I was a kid, I wore the classic. Forrest Gump, you know, cast and braces and um, my, my feet would always point terminally in. And actually, there's martial arts horse dance that straightened my feet. It squared my, it squared my, my, my gait to walk normally. Um, but he was a person who, you know, would, would, would encourage me. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but I had a photographic memory. And then years later in high school, would find out I had a genius level IQ. So we would have these martial arts magazines. And after I picked up my first one, I was addicted and I would buy them all whenever I could get them. Well, I wouldn't just buy them. I'd memorize them verbatim. And I would quote stuff verbatim that I remembered and learned. Um, here I am little 12 year old kid with uh, three different colored flare markers and I'm taking notes and I'm marking down each one of my techniques. So I don't forget them. And I remember them. I can go back and look. And um, that's the way it was. You know, I, I trained in my blue belt school closed down. What do I do now? I go start training in different martial arts. So Taekwondo, Tatang Sudo, I mean, what was what locally available to me. Um, enter the martial arts master, Jack Leonardo, a man who brought Aikido to New Bedford. A man who literally lived that martial arts master. He was Mr. Miyagi. He was that way. It was the way he was as a person. And he was uh, sold martial arts books and martial arts supplies out of his, uh, originally his accordion and York barbell store. And then he got involved in Aikido through Iron Man magazine and then brought, brought Aikido to New Bedford and started training with uh, Kisamaru Kanai at the, New, Bef- at the uh, New England Aikikai. And he was an inspiration to me. And he was the one who inspired me to learn different martial arts. But the funny thing was, he would tell the story of the rabbits. You know, man, a hunter goes to chase one rabbit. He's just about to catch. Ah, he sees another rabbit. So that's to chase that one. Ah, because he's about to catch. Oh, he has another rabbit. He goes in, and he ends up with nothing. And I went, well, I'm thinking to myself, no, I want a, I want a, I want a bag full of rabbits. I want, I want more than one. And um, lo and behold, I was uh, introduced to a, a gentleman through an ad in this uh, local newspaper looking for students that want to learn private lessons in Kung Fu. I'd always wanted to learn Kung Fu. And I met a gentleman, uh, Chris Vieira, another guy, Leo Assert. And they were teaching this hybrid Southern Kung Fu system in uh, Leo's basement. 
And uh, Chris had learned with a gentleman, Ron Champlain, who some of your listeners may remember as Master Chi, and he used to do demonstrations at the Oriental World of Self Defense and whatnot. And um, you know, I, I kind of realized because I was I was addicted to all these martial arts magazines that uh, uh, if we weren't doing kung fu, if we were doing nihon chi, you know, we weren't. This was this wasn't kung fu. This was some hybrid, whatever they were putting together. But hey, it was any port in a storm, and it was some place to train. Um, then I went to European Health Spa, and I was working out there, and I met this uh, gentleman who was one of the uh, salesmen there, John Gabriel, and uh, John. Um, was a uh, in the military in the Air Force, and he was uh, stationed in Taiwan. And he used to work on the radar systems for the old B-52 bombers. And while he was there, he studied Taekwondo. You would think he's in Taiwan, he studied Kung Fu. But Taekwondo was incredibly popular in Taiwan. And his instructor, Cheng Lu, was General Choi's representative for Taekwondo in Taiwan. But Master Lu was also the son of the ambassador, Chinese ambassador, to Korea. So he lived in Korea, and as a, as a, as a Chinese person in Korea, is they, were, they were mandarins, they were aristocrats. So he was required to learn about China, a job, Korean culture, and also Korean calligraphy. So he learns with this guy, Don Il, who was also teaching Taekyeon. And his fellow calligraphy student was Choi Ho and He or Master Che, the founder of modern Taekwondo. So after the Japanese occupation, they took off. And then, of course, Mao decided to start the Cultural Revolution and then being Mandarins with money, guess what? They left with Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek, emigrated to Taiwan. So he was doing that and Taekwondo, and he was uh, and they also doing Taekwondo, which was not only the, the Taiwanese pronunciation of it, but with Cheng Lu, it was a combination of that and eight different Kung Fu systems, different, well, different Kung Fu systems he had learned. So on the higher level, once you got all the hard style work, you went to the soft style material. And there were eight master sets regarding that. So here I am, I'm learning with John Gabriel. Um, and I'm also a uh, Sensei Leonardo after a while, realized I wanted to learn weaponry. So I was doing Aiki Ken and Aiki Joe with him. Uh, Morei Yoshibe's le legacy of the sword and the short staff. And then I meet up and I find out that they're teaching Kung Fu, real Kung Fu, Wu-Tang, no less, the Wu-Tang Clan, at my local university, SMU, Southeastern Massachusetts University. So I go there and I meet this blonde-haired, blue-eyed instructor, Ed Jada, who is a student of uh, Master Jason Zhou. So uh, I go in and I'm like, psych, I want to learn the real Kung Fu. This is fantastic. I talked to him. He said, so um, do you do other martial arts? He goes, yeah, I do Kempo Karate and I do this. Oh, then we can't accept you as a student. Huh? My instructor says you'll poison the Kung Fu. I said, with all due respect, I expect hearing that from an Oriental, not some blonde-haired, blue-eyed white guy. <laughs> but um, he was, he was just, he wouldn't teach me. Mm. So um, like the old Kung Fu movies, I learned, I learned was you keep going back. So I kept going back to classes and wouldn't accept me again to three weeks go by. And that third week, I show up at one class and none of his students are there. Just him. So I sit there and say, okay, here's all your college students who aren't here at the class. Yet here I am, the karate guy who's been asking you for three weeks and showing up every single time. And now they're not here, but I am. He goes, you know what? You're absolutely right. And he started to teach me. So I learned uh, Northern Praying Mantis, uh, Six Harmony, Seven Star, and Eight Step Mantis. I learned uh, Tai Chi Chuan, uh, Chen Style, Wu Style, and, uh, and, and Yang's. Well, the Yang's I learned a late, later on. Um, uh, Piqua, Mizong, The Lost Track, or, or The Labyrinth System, uh, the classic system that, that Bruce Lee attempts to imitate in uh, Chinese Connection. Um, and um, so I'm learning from him. So I'm studying Taekwondo and Taichuan Dao and sometimes taking a bus all the way out to Wareham. And if I miss the last bus, <laughs> I sleep on the mat. And then I get up first thing in the morning, catch a first bus back to, back to New Bedford. Um, I, I go study every Saturday about Japanese swordsmanship and the short staff and how it cross-references his spear and the bow staff. I go train in uh, Kung Fu up at SMU. 
So while all this is going on, I'm learning all these arts simultaneously. Uh, I see my old, I see the assistant instructor from the old United Studios of Self-Defense, a guy by the name of Jim Gagnon. And uh, oh, it's great to see you. What have you been up to? Oh, I'm teaching out of my basement. Been there before. Okay, cool. Can I go? Well, he asked me, he said, how far did you get? He said, I got the blue bell. How come you never got the black? The school closed. You know, I mean, they had other instructors subsequently, and I had worked with a couple of them. But I was hooked on the way at, at, at uh, Hosmer taught. <laughs> Two Eds, Ed Jada, Ed Hosmer. And we're not up to the third one yet. But uh, so I started training with him. And uh, Leo Lacerda got very disillusioned about the whole thing about the, his, the hybrid kung fu system that wasn't teaching. But we had become friends. And we would compare magazines and books and videos and, you know, whatever came out at that time. Uh, and um, told him about Jim. And he's like, uh, he really didn't have a high opinion of Kempo until he met Jim. Well, they were both Vietnam veterans. They were both in Vietnam around the same time. They were even in the same area, if I'm not mistaken, of Vietnam. So they got along famously. So Leo decided to try Kempo. So here we are. And uh, another gentleman, Ron Valier, and a couple other individuals were taking classes and whatnot. And in January 83, I get my black belt in Kempo. And uh, my Taekwondo instructor, John Gabriel, says, Joe, get your black belt. And this was just before that. He goes, he's like, he says, Joe, until you get that black belt, you have more knowledge than any three local black belts I know. But until you get that black belt, they won't respect you. You'll just be some underrank that, that knows a lot of stuff. So in 83, I got my black belt in Kempo, and within five years, I had black belts in five martial arts or instructor certification in Kung Fu. So life's not boring. Yeah, life is certainly not boring. I want to go back. I want to go back to that, that moment when you walk in, when you want to learn Kung Fu, and the gentleman says, no, you'll poison it. What made you go back? Jeremy, at that point? Huh? What made you go back? I don't, it, it, you knew enough martial arts at the time that you, you were proud of what you had done. And here, this gentleman is, is not only telling you that he won't take you as a student, he is telling you he won't take you as a student because of the work that you've put in up to that point. Well, did you want to train mentally, you? at that point, you do the two things you don't do during sex. Point and laugh. You get that one? I'm a frustrated stand-up comedian. Um, I, you know what? I didn't take him as his word. I looked at him and I looked and I saw a little bit of in insincerity in that. Not that he was just kind of blowing me off. And, and, and you know what? I mean, that's as old as time itself. I had read enough martial arts magazines and books to know, okay, that's, that's the fake blow-off line. So keep coming back. Keep showing them. They want to see loyalty. They want to see sincerity. And they want to see a want to know and learn. And when you show them that, it's real tough for them to say no. Especially when they've got people who don't feel the same way, who don't appreciate it as much, who don't enjoy it as much, who don't want it as badly. So when you get someone who does, sooner or later, you look at them and go, you know, you really do want this pretty bad, don't you? Go, yep. Okay, come on in. And maybe it takes a day, a week, a month, a year. Who knows? But you know what? If you want it badly enough, you'll move heaven and earth to get it. Isn't that Dale Carnegie? Right? That's the key. So you got to want it badly enough. And um, I didn't stop. I kept learning. You know, and thank God for Leo Lassert because Leo did one of the best things he ever did. Um, was at the time after we got our black belts, we thought we were doing Ed Parker's Kempo. We were completely mistaken. The system was completely different, but we didn't know. So Leo got in touch with the, with the head of Kempo, which we knew was Ed Parker. So he got in touch with Mr. Parker. And around that time, Professor Nick Sirio, Kalai Griffin, Tony and Doreen Cogliandro were all contacting Mr. Parker about getting him to come back to New England and teach. Now, Nick Sirio had been with the IKK and Mr. Parker system back in 1969. And for whatever reasons, they parted ways. And then Nick Sirio went to go train with Professor Child, Mr. Parker's instructor, for a while. And then went his own path and whatnot. But they, they wanted to get back involved with him. And Leo, unbeknownst to, us, unbeknownst to any of those people, you know, contacted Mr. Parker. He didn't know. So it all happened to work out we got in on the ground floor and got to work with Mr. Par Mr. Parker. 
and got to meet him and started taking uh, seminars with him. We really wanted to do private lessons with him, but at the time, the, the machine in New England wasn't allowing anybody to do that. And, um, but I did something that was unheard of that kind of irked some people, but I want to open up the first Ed Parker franchise in New England and contact Mr. Parker directly. And, you know, truth be told, at that time, the people in New England didn't know the system. What was I supposed to do? That wasn't my fault. I just wanted to learn the system. And I irked some people because I wanted to do that. But Mr. Parker, you know, saw that I wanted to learn, saw that I wanted to do it, saw I was willing to put money into it. Unfortunately, my backers at the time um, decided not to do it. But Mr. Parker never forgot that and never forgot me. So. Here I was, the Kempo groupie, going to every one of his seminars that I could from 1983 till his death in 1990, as many as I could, because um, I wanted to learn. And he knew that. And it just got to a point where it was like, okay, well, you know, the local sources have stopped, meaning we caught up. What do we do now? Okay, well, I send you to this guy or I send you to that guy. or send you, And I, we would go to these different camps and seminars and go train with these different instructors because we really wanted to learn. The system. And in 1985, we, I opened a commercial school and uh, biggest mistake of my life, I opened it with other people to the advice of my backers. Should have never done it. Should have been me first and the gimme gimme's. But you live and learn. Um, but because of that, I was without a school for a little bit, but it didn't stop me. Um, just kept on going, kept on doing what I'm doing and being who I was. And, and I kept, kept learning and training. And uh, I met another gentleman who uh, was uh, a, a Puerto Rican extract, not surgically, um, from, uh, that was teaching in New Bedford, and he was teaching at the local YWCA, and his name was Carlos Febrez. And at that time, this was, this was the beginning of the ninja craze, and uh, he taught ninjutsu. But the original arts he learned were Okinawan Kenpo and Kobujutsu. And I saw he had rank in Kobudo. I had learned weapons forms, but I had nobody to go to, to get rank. So I go to see him and the classic phrase, he says to me, like I thought was, so you want to embrace the dark arts? No. Oh, good. That's how we check for the crazies. <laughs> All right. So you want to learn ninjutsu? No. Okay. Now I think you're crazy again. I said, you got rank in Kobudo, dude. You have legitimate rank in Kobujutsu and Okinawan weaponry. Would you be willing to teach it? Wow, you're the first guy who ever asked. What do you think about it? I'm patient. I'll wait. Get to keep going to classes, visiting them. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Okay. So start learning the traditional katas and getting ranked through him. Also, I'm learning, I'm learning ninjutsu through osmosis. I can't help it. It's the way my brain works. So I'm watching him do the classes, and it's like, you know, watching him do Japanese sword. Oh, okay, you do Japanese sword too? I have some foundation in that. You're Aiki Joe. Aiki Ken, rather. Oh, cool. Okay. Not learning Yaijitsu as well. Um, it was just the way I worked. Always learning. Always learning. Mine's like a parachute. Keep it open. Keep learning. Um, cross reference to uh, Ed Parker and Bruce Lee. You must empty your cup, of your tea, before you can drink mine. He goes, You know, Bruce, I got a big appetite and I got a big thirst. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this full cup that I've got in my knowledge, and I'm going to put it up on the mantle. And I'm going to pull out a second empty cup, and I'm going to fill it with your tea. And you know what that's going to make me, Bruce, with a cup in each hand? I'm going to be a two-fisted drinker. Well, I wanted to be a two-fisted drinker. I wanted, I wanted to learn. There was never enough hours in the day. There were enough days in the week, weeks in the month, months in the years to learn. And it was always something new to learn, always something different to learn. And as I learned, I got confirmation of the other arts because they would do certain things. And I get answers to things in my other arts that they would never tell me because they didn't know. The other art did, though. They provided that answer. They provided those insights. And like I said, it, Ed Parker said it itself, it's a, it's a series of infinite insights. Did I answer your question? No, but that's okay. Okay. I thought I did. In, in a, I didn't get. I, yeah. I mean, back, I mean, simply stand. I didn't let it get to me. I, yeah. I never let it get to me. 
I never let people's opinions get to me. I don't worry about the haters. I don't worry about the people on the internet who carry their testicles in a cyber wheelbarrow. They're not important. They're only important if they affect me. Right. That doesn't mean I don't respect their opinion, because I do. It doesn't mean I don't value their opinion, because I do. But, you know, some... Uh, Jeremy, I've learned over the years that all martial arts are not created equal, and anybody who says it really doesn't know all the martial arts. Mm. That there are people are, oh, it's all the same. No, it's not. You know, you know, some people are stuck in elementary school. Some people only have an eighth grade education. Other people are college are college professors with, with multiple degrees. Intelligence quotient is 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 not always the same. So the arts are not always the same. There are styles that only have like three empty hand forms and a couple of weapon arts. There are others who have hundreds of forms within them. It's not all the same, but we are more alike than we are different. So when someone tells me no, I always consider it a definite maybe. You might say that now, but that doesn't mean two weeks down the road, you might not feel the same way. And I've proved that a couple of times in my life with different people I worked with. No, just keep asking. I agree. The worst they can say is no. Right. And when someone says no, that really hasn't changed the situation versus not asking. Nope. Exactly. And guess what? Your no will be somebody else's yes. Because yep. I've had situations where certain instructors wouldn't teach. Here's the key. Here's the key, Jeremy. This is a, this is a story really I'm, I'm glad I can share with your, with your listeners. Um, you got to be in on the joke. Okay, I'm, I'm always cracking jokes and whatnot. Many times I have worked with various martial arts instructors and who've trained with various masters and grandmasters. And I'll go, hey, you know when your master does this or this? Or I remember one time I was working with a particular instructor and we were talking about Professor Chow. And um, I said, okay, you know when Professor Chow would do his double angle bone breaks and he would break the arm and one to the and he turned over the second hand and break it so it shatter so it wouldn't work right, kind of like Hawaiian Lua and what's it goes. So wait, wait. You know that? Yeah. How do you know that? I because I've worked with half a dozen of Professor Chow students. Oh, well, if you know that, now the floodgates are open. Now the doors now the doors burst wide open, the floodgates are open, and boom. Now it's okay. Well, if you know that. And that's considered a secret in our system. And you know the secret. Then obviously people trusted you. So I can trust you here. Blah, 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 blah. Right. And it's happened many times. And I remember one seminar doing that. And another person walked up to me and said, Joe. Yeah. It was like Bobby. You know, uh, if, you, if you follow Howie Mandel. Well, um, Joe. Yeah. Why is it what you're going over with that person isn't what we're going over? I had the right question to ask and it opened the doors. And, you know, as you have these tidbits of information and knowledge regarding a particular person's system, um, I run a TV show, just like you're running this podcast. It's always great when you got that, that, that two or three you know, quarters in your pocket or silver dollars in your pocket to put in the slot machine. Meaning you've got a particular comment or statement or knowing something about them to go, you know that? How do you know that? Why do you know that? And it opens up a whole line of conversation. It opens up a whole line of insights and knowledge that probably wouldn't have been tapped before if I hadn't had that little silver dollar in my pocket, that question or that comment or that piece of factoid or memory from a martial arts magazine from 1978 or, or, or a book that, that they had published in, you know, the sixties and that's the key. And it opens that door and the floodgates open. And that's the beauty of it. Hmm. So what next? When you reflect on all of these people you've trained with the, the 60 plus styles you've trained in, and I'm going to speculate hundreds of instructors. Who's been the most well, influential? Well, not hundreds. No. No, not hundreds. Okay. No, I, I'm honest about it. You know, a bunch. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them were, I mean, I don't have 60 black belts. Right. 22, no, no. Actually, three now. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, exactly. I'm not the, I'm not the average person, you know, Jeremy, I'm right. not. Right. Um, 
But, you know, I, I mean, I got, like I said, you got a, a recently a person in the field, uh, uh, he had me do a test online and talked me on the phone and whatnot. He says, Mr. Ravel, you don't just have a photographic memory, you have a photo identic memory. I said, okay, what's the difference? With photographic, you just take a picture and you can detail out the names in a picture. You're photo identic. You have different ideas. You cross reference and interrelate material. That's photo identic. Mm-hmm. You take ideas and you identify them and you cross reference them. But you ask about influential instructors. Ed Parker, man, what a genius. What a genius. We were in New Bedford, Massachusetts at a seminar, and um, we were talking about, I had asked him several questions. I asked him you know, about, about the black gi and why we wear a black gi. I asked why um, he didn't like the term master. He was, not, he, was not, he was always Mr. Parker. And I gave a great analogy on that one. He said, first of all, Joseph, um, the only the only person that is my master is my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was a Mormon, a member of the Church of Latter Day Saints, and he said, in order for there to be masters, there have to be slaves. And I never want any of my students to ever be a slave to me. Um, he was insightful, and we were talking, and I said, you know, Mr. Parker, you're a genius. He goes, ah, I don't know about that, Joseph. I said, why, Mr. Parker? He goes, Joseph, most geniuses are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That was Ed Parker. Um, another person, David German. David German made me think outside the box. David German, I'm looking at the cover from the March 1981 issue of Black Belt and a big poster of him on the cover with a guy, uh, Tim Carter. And um, he was the eclectic character. He was the guy who did, mixed uh, Kenpo with, uh, with White Tiger Kung Fu and grappling, Udo Jiu Jitsu from Al Thomas, you know, before it was cool. So he would do a standing tempo technique and go into a Kung Fu technique. And then he would, he would choke the guy out and he'd take him to the ground. He'd follow him to the ground and grapple him from the ground and crank him. You know, forced yoga, you send them, we bend them, you know? Um, and his thought process was different. He thought differently. He thought out of the box before they brought out the boxes, you know? Um, he made me look at my system of Kempo with Mr. Parker differently. He made me have a whole new appreciation for grappling. He made me have a whole new appreciation for ground war. I hated to be on the ground. I had no clue. Here's a quarter. Go buy a clue. Here's a dime. Call someone who cares. <laughs> I'm sorry. Phone calls are 50 cents. You can't afford a clue. <laughs> that was me. That's how I felt. But he made me, th- he changed my process in that. He made me think and look differently at the way the body worked and the way the body was controlled and manipulated. And um, Thai, transition, action, incorporated. To incorporate the various actions we have at their transitions. And that gave me a whole new insight. And again, somebody else going, it's okay to do that. It's all right. So many instructors in our world are still so narrow-minded, xenophobic, and stuck in the, the blinders and the pigeonholed you know, uh, mindset. They can't think outside the box. They're happy in the box. It's nice and warm in their blankets here. You know, uh, you know, it's like a joke of a friend of mine said, yeah, your mind's in the gutter. I said, we have all my friends in here and it's nice and warm and dark. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a matter of, of your mindset. How, how do you perceive motion? Who influences you? I have so many instructors. I turn around and uh, Jeremy and I'm in my dojo and I look on a wall and I see a long line of pictures. And I look at the people like Bob Smith from Shao Choi Hong Kung Fu. He's gone. Jack Leonardo Aikido. He's gone. Leo Lacerda and Kempo in Kung Fu. He's gone. You know, Mr. Parker, you know, David German, my latest instructor who passed Frank Trejo, you know, Professor Chow, Remy Priestess, another one of my instructors, Bill Gregory from the Kaiju Kempo Pylum, Danny Pai's lineage. And, um, you know, I, I look at all the legacies with each one of them. And, and there was no one influential person. There couldn't be. I did too many arts. I did too many styles. I had too much fun. Yeah. And because of that, there's so many great stories for me, every one of them. You know, from, from working with sticks with Professor Priestess to, to working with Frank Trejo on Kempo Fusion, who was, who was a, uh, he was a, he was a fighter. He was a fighter. I mean, I even worked with Bill, a- Bill Aguiar at one point from the original Black Dragon Fighting Society, the real one from Count Dante. And when I got in there, I found out that they were doing Kempo. They were basically doing Tracy Kempo and found out that that's where Dante had come from. After he left Trias, he went to go train with Ed Parker. So, uh, you know, what's that old phrase from Bloom County or Doonesbury? We have met the enemy and they are us. 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm tangent, man. That's, <sighs> hey, that is, that is the whole purpose. That is the hallmark of this show, the tangents. The best things are on the edges. I started this show because my favorite part of martial arts training was when the instructors would kind of get sidetracked and tell stories. Because for me, that gave me so much more context to what I was learning. And that's kind of how we got here. Well, then, then, then let me share a story on how I started my TV shows. Please. Uh, simply stated, one day, I'm at McDonald's. I'm competing. I'm in a top 10 New England in Crane and the PKL at the time. Um, I'm at McDonald's. I'm with Ho Sung Pak, Ho Young Pak, and Richie Brandon. And who knew that years later, I would be with all three individuals who were in the Black Belt and Inside Kung Fu Halls of Fame who basically all three would be picked up by um, Four Kids Productions and be featured on Fox TV for WMAC Masters. We were just three guys, we were four guys competing in soft style division. And basically in New England, they had a Kempo division at the time. Thank God for Tony Cogliandro and Don Rodriguez putting one in. So I could compete. And I was the first person ever to perform Mr. Parker's forms and get rated in top 10 New England. And when I couldn't do Kempo, I was put in soft style. But the gig was... I could do Kung Fu. I could do Mantis. And Richie knew it. And other. So we're just hanging and uh, asked, talking about where the next tournament was. I said, man, I wish I had a camera. I wish I had a movie camera or a video camera to record this. Because what were the chances of being here and being like this in, this in this atmosphere and being able to talk shop, talk to people about their life and career, how they started in the martial arts, what made them do the arts that they do? And then um, in 1990, Ed Parker died. And I was devastated. Two years later, the grandmaster of the Wu-Tang group, and I am a real member of the Wu-Tang clan, folks. Uh, Taiwan based, but grandmaster Liu, Liu Yingqiao, died. And I was like, you know, if I don't talk to these people, if I don't talk to them about their life and their career and whatnot, and really, you know, and have a pertinent question, just like, like, like what, do, what we're doing here. Um, if you if I don't have something that opens the door, opens those floodgates, and talk to them about their life and careers, you know, and that would just let's see karate stuff, you know, something more deep and meaningful. Then um, I really wanted to do something, so I, I started a program in 1990, and uh, uh, Jeff Speakman at the time had just done the Perfect Weapon, and um, he was being brought into New England, and I I grabbed a. Uh, uh, video camera and told him, Hey, I've got this TV show, martial arts today, TV. I didn't tell him he was the first show, but I got an interview with him and we shot an action segment. And I sat there with an Amiga video toaster and two VCRs. And I put the show together and, um, started from there. And, uh, again, martial arts today is about, um, history of the it's a it's a, a program focusing on the history and philosophy styles and celebrities of the martial arts and that's how it all started mm. and now uh october 3rd is going to be 29 years on the air cool i think i simply think i wanted the longest continuous running martial arts television programs in this country I, I i think i'm fairly accurate on that i can't yeah i've been looking around i i would imagine so what so um what what guest haven't you gotten? Who if you could wave a magic wand, <laughs> who, who would be top on the list? Tons, on Jeremy. The list? Oh my gosh. You know, I with the symposium, you know who I haven't interviewed yet? Bill Wallace. Really? And I was talking with uh, yeah, I've talked about Bill a couple of times. I said, Bill, we gotta do the interview. Not a interview, Bill. That's not enough. When I first met Bill, it is a funny story. I first met Bill Wallace at the, the Heinz Auditorium in Boston. Uh, they were running a big um, uh, fit, uh, President's Council on Physical Fitness event. Uh, Jeff Cooper, the man who basically coined the term aerobics, was there, and a uh, special guest was Bill Super Wallace. I, at the time, was teaching the Guardian Angels in New Bedford. Uh, one, late one night, I heard a woman have a, uh, I heard a scream of abject horror and terror. Thankfully, I was still in my gi at home practicing, run out into the street with my uniform and my black belt holding a razor sharp Chinese broadsword ready to take out any sucker who was attacking this woman. I run up to the corner. I had just missed Cheryl Ann Arujo being gang raped at the Big Dan's uh, bar on Belleville Avenue. Now, that made national headlines. As a matter of fact, Jodie Foster made it, made it into a film known as The Accused. And, um, but because of that, 
Curtis Sliwa brought the Guardian Angels to New Bedford. And they had another guy teaching. I was watching the guy. And he couldn't make it all the way from Boston to New Bedford to teach them. The group said, hey, you're teaching Kempa. Yeah, I am. I'm black belt. And we're talking, oh, man, oh, man I'm looking for somebody locally. You're interested in teaching? I was like, sure. So I ended up being the instructor. One day I'm running in wrestling shoes. It was one to A6. I hit the blade of my foot running in place. I break the blade of my foot. Oh, man. But they have this event coming up. It's Bill stinking Superfoot Wallace. So, uh, I walk up, I'm on crutches, no less. So Bill, I got a very strange request. And this is, this is the weird part of my life where I, was, I wanted to feel what it was like to get hit by some of the deadliest people on the planet. Um, I had had um, the middleweight, middleweight champ Marvin Hagler hit me with his left hook. Um, obviously, getting beat up by Mr. And Mr. Parker liked me, so he hit me a lot, which was great. That's how I knew it worked. So I'm on his crutches. I'm telling Bill Wallace, Bill, do me a favor. What? Hit me in the head with a roundhouse kick. I'll put on the headgear. He's like, like, are you kidding me? They'll kill, they'll, I can see it now. Bill Wallace hits the handicapped. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, of course, I asked Bill, okay, what cheeseburger place to go to? Come on. Was it with McDonald's? Burger King? What was it this morning? Because, you know, he's got the most horrible diet in the world, but he's going to outlive us all. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, we got a picture taken together back then. And it, 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 it's, and uh, I was talking to him uh, the last time I saw him. I said, God, I get it, man. I had the one. So I'm talking to Terry Dow, who's been in my place, my, my TV studio, by the way. Um, and we're going to shoot one this, this time around. But it's got to be comprehensive. It's got to be something where I want Bill to go, how in the blue hell do you know that? You know, why do you know that? Why did, and, and, but it's going to be, you know, we have extended episodes on YouTube, ladies and gentlemen. You can look up Martial Arts Today TV on youtube and see extended episodes um which guess that's what i can make the episode as darn long as i want it i've had episodes for an hour and a half uh, john painter the famous bagua master hour and, hour and 21 minutes you know it's as long as we, we're going to have it and go over it that's the key but um bill's one of them um jackie chan had the opportunity unfortunately it, it fell through um, we were supposed to do an interview at one point with Steven Seagal that fell through. He was living in Massachusetts at the time. No lie. This was many, many years ago. Um, wow. You know, uh, Jet Li, um, uh, okay. Uh, you know, Jet Li I actually met originally in 1980 when he was with the Beijing Wushu team. Mm. Uh, Brendan Lai, who used to run Brendan Lai's martial arts supplies. They had an appearance in Boston and Jet did a drunken set. And matter of fact, uh, uh, for those, uh, um, video files in uh, um, martial arts. If you find a product that was put out by Sid Campbell and Eric Lee called the 1980 Oakland Martial Arts Coliseum demonstration or symposium, it might have been symposium, I don't think it was symposium, but um, it has Jet Li doing a drunken form as part of the member of the Beijing Wushu team. So um, I went to the Boston appearance and I walk up to Brendan Lai and he knew me because I was a regular customer. And I said, can I meet the gentleman who did the drunken set? I pointed to the young man's picture. So he's like, why? I'll well, get a picture. Oh, sure. Goes in, calls him over. And here comes a, a young Jet Li. You know, Li Jia Ye, I believe. And um, so we get a picture. He's kind of looking weird, like, what the heck? You know? So he explains to him in Chinese. He really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the drunken set. And, you know, he wants him. That's true, true. He's like, he shrugs his shoulder. Sure. He's big smile, thumbs up. You get a picture. So uh, who knew? So it's magical moments. You know, you, you know greatness before it was great. That was already great. It just wasn't on celluloid yet. And that's the key. So. Keep wondering if I answered the question. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Honestly, the moment I asked the question, I forget that I've asked it. My goal is just right. to, to keep you talking. That's all I do here. I just yeah. I just, well, like, I just keep well, you going. Like, like I said, well, you ask the question where there's so many. It's not just like one or two. There's there's so many people, and for different reasons and different arts and different abilities and different skill sets. Right. Um. The saddest part is the people I really want to interview are gone. You know, someone asked me the other day, they said, you know, what does it take to be a grand master? I looked them in the face and said, your instructors die. And that blew his mind. He didn't expect that to be the answer. It wasn't, it was not, it was one of many, but I mean, that really is one. 
You know, no one gets up in the morning going, I think I'll be a master in 20 years. I'm going to be a grand master. I mean, some people have those, 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 those aspirations and, and visions in their head, but I'm not, that, I'm not wired that way. Right. Al Tracy tells me one day, Joseph, do you know what it takes to be a master? And I name off different things from different arts. And he goes, no. he says, Joseph, you'll be a master when the masters call you to their table. And remember, they'll only call you once. Well, you know, Jeremy, I've lucked out. They've done it a few times now. <laughs> and, and it's because I'm not looking. I, you know, okay, we're going to get a little blue here, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, just be warned. You might find this, 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 this particular comment slightly offensive if you do. Tough luck. But anyway, um, when I look at that stuff and I, I look at the whole thing and I just blanked down this great line I was going to say, I can't believe it. Oh, um, I'm not waving my belt like my penis saying, put another stripe on this like a condom. That's not what it's about, you know? Uh, you know, but by the same token, Jeremy, I love everything. There's a big line here all the time. No egos. There are no egos here. Then what the hell are we doing here? What do you mean? Well, you know, we have, you know, if, if you're big into philosophy and psychology, you've got the super ego, you got the id, you got the ego. You know, ego is what makes us do stuff. You know, if, if I really, if I really had no ego, then I just, and, and sometimes we do this in martial arts, it's that whole Kung Fu religious analogy. And that's why certain people live in a cot, you know, <laughs> instead of having a, a mansion. It's because we're caught up in this whole concept of, of an art that was basically based on religious monks, which I, I sit there, who, you know, lived, I sit there, guys, they lived in a temple because people believed in God. They were, they, the people wanted to buy their way into heaven or at least obtain heaven. So they, they helped these people out to help to foster their religions and their mindsets regarding this. We're not monks. We, we work for a living. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So how well do you work? Are, are, you, are you driving the Porsche back to your, your mansion or your villa in Costa Rica? Or are you sitting there going, well, I'm just this side shy of homeless, so I guess I'll go sleep on the mat. Where are you in that? You know, what, at what point are you on that level of success or, or, or understanding? Or, you know, I mean, Aaron Banks, Aaron Banks ran the Oriental World of Self Defense. He died sleeping on a cot in his dojo. Now, would you think someone who had that level of success would pass that way? But they did. So, what does that say in regards, you know, not, it has nothing to do with his martial arts prowess, it has to do for his ability to deal with life so i sit there i'm not i'm not big on on you know uh my my phrase my phrase i have you know i have a lot of titles and when you when you look at my 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 bio it reads like uh like like a bad oriental menu or a good one depending on your point of view <laughs> um and um i am i'm i'm a sensei i'm a sifu i'm a subumnim um I'm a Hanshi. I've been a Shi, uh, Shihan. Don't be a lot of Shihan. I don't say Han, uh, Hanshi, Kiyoshi, professor, master, grandmaster. And I always say titles are the shields of the weak, actions are the swords of the strong. A good warrior has a sword and a shield. So, you know, it's all about putting it out there. I mean, if someone calls me grandmaster, that's nice. If they call me master, okay. If they call me professor, that's cool. You know. The classic phrase line, they don't call me late for supper. But, you know, I, I'm really, I'm not caught up in that. I'm caught up in learning. I'm caught up in teaching. I'm caught up in having fun. You know, we have a motto at my school. If it's not fun, you won't do it. I've been doing this for almost half a century now. I do it because I love it. It was great stuff. I can do this for a living too. Cool. You know, I'm having a field day. And I always am. And that, that's the key. Um, I just never thought, I never thought I'd be to the point where highly, you know, people who I respect, who I've admired, who I believed in and, you know, have appreciated, you know, know me. And you know, thank God for Alan Goldberg and the action martial arts event. Thank God for my TV show because people know me now. I mean, when Dan Severin or Dana Abbott or Cynthia Rothrock, hi, Joe, how you doing? Or, hey, you know, and then, I mean, I was just at, and we got to give it the credit throughout the, the plug, uh, Jesse Bowen's uh, uh, event for the Who's Who in Martial Arts uh, 2018 Martial Arts Masters and Pioneers. The reason I got into the book because they had Martial Arts Masters and Pioneers. I thought it was cool. It was different. 
And I really hadn't had a place where I could put my autobiography and talk about my career and have something that stood the test of time. And that's what, what it comes down to, your ability to stand the test of time in your life and career. So, um, you know, I'm there for the event and I'm in the book. Great, cool. And uh, just taking a seminar with Dana, always a white belt, man. Go back. I just want to learn. Japanese sword. Okay, new idea and perspective on it. Cool. Well, confirmation of the facts. And uh, then it would Dan Severn talking about his life in Michigan, his family, and, you know, and, uh, you know, standing there getting my tickets. And Cynthia Rothrock walks up to him and goes, hi, Joe. And that blew my mind. You know, I've known Cynthia for years, but I mean, for her to initiate that without me going, no, 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 I leave them alone, but they get to know me. And I've I've done an episode with Cynthia as well. I'll do another one. But anyway, we're we're there for that event. And um, they call my name for the book. And I watch Dana Abbott and Dan Severin, who are up on the board, just thrust their hands in the air and stand up and go, yeah, Joe! I'm like going, holy crap, I can't buy publicity like that. I can't buy moments like that. That's the magic moment. That's when you know. That's when you know that they know and they know you. And it's beyond how many stripes are on your belt or what color gi you wear, or in my case, how many patches are on my uniform. And anybody who knows me, I am Emblem Man, you are Patch Boy. One day you too will be Emblem Man. You know, so I, my, my gis are shrines to my instructors in the organizations I do. And I don't mind wearing the glorified martial arts bowling shirt. No biggie. Yeah, you can tell I'm cracking jokes here. Uh, right. You know, this is the fifth time you've laughed, by the way. I've been keeping track. Only which is five. Good. That's oh, what we well, want. Well, that's. Yeah, that's I know. I we got to go back I and listen to this thing afterwards and keep back. track. It's I like a drinking back. game. Every time Jeremy laughs, we have a shot. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I don't drink, by the way. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. You don't need to. No. It sounds like you have plenty sure. of fun without. Oh, fun. It's fun. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it, it's great. And, you know, I mean, it's funny because, you know, Jeremy simply stated, um, you know how the internet works. Most people don't believe you. If you've got multiple ranks, you have to be like 300 or 400 years old to be able to learn that many sites and that many styles, or you got to be me. I'm the exception to the rule, guys. I'm not your average person. I'm not your average Joe, as the old adage goes, right? I'm me. And people don't believe it until like they come to my studio and they go, it's like a freaking museum in here, Joe. I was like, yeah, it is. Isn't it? I should actually, I should actually apply for that. Yeah. And it's like, Hey, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for this video. Or, you ever seen this instructor? Or, I'm looking for this book or I'm looking for this, um, you know, um, manual. I'm looking, yeah, no problem. Here it is. Boom. Look, I see the other four versions of it. What? <laughs> uh, you want to see more footage of that guy? Well, you know, you ever seen this? I haven't seen that. Are you, how'd you get him to record? How'd you know what to ask him? was nice i like what he does i remember stuff i guess i'm back to that version of uh the the line from uh the 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 pc line from game of thrones you know um i think and i know stuff because i don't drink i don't do the other thing you mentioned so but anyway but that's the whole thing you got you do what you love you love what you do and you do it for a living and i live the martial arts and anyone who knows me you know, it's great because I'm looking at your past and, pe- and you know, uh, like Nathan Porter. Nathan's known me for years. Um, he's, t- he's been one of my students and taking classes with me. Um, you know, I've listened, I was listening to your various ones. And if there's any one I wish that you had had more questions for and knew more about his career, Rick Alamany. Now, there's somebody I want to interview, by the way. You mentioned about who do I want to interview? Who do I- Rick Alamany. There's a guy, there's a guy who's got a career and I got a ton of questions about his career. That's going to make it a great interview. That'll be awesome. Exceptional man. And actually this is, this is a perfect opportunity. So anybody that, that caught that interview knows that Grandmaster Alamany was um, not expected to survive cancer that he had. However. Yep. And uh, guess, and guess what? Rick Alamany is a fighter. He fought. And he's, he's good. He beat it. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, but the, one of those types na- of the nature of the man. Yeah. Yeah. So now now there's plenty of opportunity to to go back to get more questions from him because you know, we were we were trying trying to balance, you know, the, the time and you know, being respectful of him and 
and everything. It's a, it's a great episode if anybody hasn't, oh, yeah. hasn't listened to it. Oh, yeah. No, it's, uh, I enjoyed it immensely. That's why I'm mentioning it. Okay, okay. Um, now, I have one question. I believe you have interviewed him, but I'm not sure. Eugene Cedeno. No, I haven't. Do it. Okay. Do it soon. Do it. Can you make Here's it? a man who trained with... Yeah. Oh, yeah. No problem. Okay, Here's good. a man who trained with... <laughs> ready? Matose, Chow, Emperado, and Ralph Castro. Uh, okay. That... For, for those of line, you that are baby. not Kempo and, I mean, folk, um, those, those you, you, you don't really, we, it's pretty much all of them. Yeah, the, that's the, all the biggies. From, yeah, from that generation, all, all the major players that's, in that's the history everybody. of Kempo. Yep. I mean, I'm not, not that this person has gotten to Mr. Parker, other than, but we're saying in that lineage. Yeah. But yeah, Eudine Sedani was a great man. What a wealth of knowledge. What a, what a just a wonderful human being. I interviewed him at the uh, Gathering of the Eagles in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Professor Nick Chamberlain ran that event for the Tracys uh, and uh, had an incredible interview. And we're going to be posting that on YouTube as well. We have another one with Al DeCascos coming up. Um, that's just, it's funny because Al kept saying to me, you know, did you read my book? No. How do you know all this stuff then? He's like, you've like, you read my book. I'm, I'm ready yet. Wow. And he was really taken aback by that. I'm like, cool. I got my mission accomplished. <laughs> all right. There we go. Put that mark down there. You know? Now, if people want to but find... If people want to find your show, they want to find you, whether it's social media, websites, you know, et cetera, let, let it rip. Let's tell everybody what's going on, where they can find you, and then we'll, we'll start to wind down. Well, my big line is, I, hey, I'm Kempo Joe. Google me, baby. Bing me later. If you can't find me on the net, <laughs> you ain't looking. Um, you can find me in many ways. Uh, you can find my Facebook account. Well, my personal one is Joe Ribello, which has a ton of martial arts stuff. People actually look forward to that. That my daily cuteness, my, my shock against the darkness of the world. I'll put a bunch of cat videos and people laughing, jamming jokes and little kids laughing. I'm going, hey, man, smile. Takes less muscles to smile than frown. Um, my, uh, my web, my, uh, studio is Rebellos Kenpo Karate. And we also have a Facebook page for the studio. Uh, you can also find us on, uh, let's see on Instagram. You can find us as Kenpo Joe underscore Rebello, R E B E L O on the L's. It's one, not two, not two, but one. I'm a rebel at an O I'm too poor to afford two L's. Uh, we're also on, I believe we're, we're also on Twitter. I'm not on Snapchat yet. Uh, used to be on MySpace, ha ha. Um, but um, you can check out YouTube. Uh, my account is Kempo Joe One. Um, but you can just punch in Martial Arts Today TV. Uh, presently, I believe we have 133 videos on that site right now, and uh, we're going to be adding on more old episodes of the show. And I do instructional videos on different arts, or on just I'll, I'll read a message board and read a particular thing and go, "Now that's wrong." Or, or, or who told you that? And it's like, okay, well, time to do a video, you know? And, um, and I started doing the videos also as well on the instructional level because I would always get people, there's no way he could possibly know all those styles. So I would do stuff on that given style that person claimed I didn't know. And at that point, other people would say to him, dude, he did videos on the system that you claim he doesn't know in detail and then cross-reference them to other systems. I kind of think he knows the system. And I would do that purposely. I would do that. I would do that because A, I wanted to educate that person. B, I wanted to educate the general public. And C, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. And, um, you know, um, I just have fun with what I do. But um, uh, you can also, and again, email kenpojoe at AOL.com. And you know it's bad when I have it embroidered on the back of one of my uniforms. I remember one guy going off about that. I was like, it's the 21st century. And, you know, one of the things while we're on YouTube, you know, I love these guys who sit there and flip out and going, oh, yeah, my sensei is YouTube. <laughs> and I go, are you telling me that 150 years ago or even 50 years ago, that if you could show these masters footage of their masters doing the form that section they forgot because they didn't write it down or whatever, and suddenly there's an instructor doing the entire form, so now they can make the corrections and do it right or do it the way their instructor taught them or get greater insights in the system? Are you telling me they wouldn't eat that up like porridge? Are you kidding? That's porridge is great. But uh, like pizza, will you say, you know, are you kidding me? You know, YouTube's one of the greatest things that has happened in our society. Yep. Fantastic. Well, and you know why it's the most incredible thing in the world? Because, ladies and gentlemen, you can listen to episodes of Whistle Kick on YouTube. Sure can. Every one of them. You bet. Hey, you know, this, this has been a ton of fun. And I'd like to ask you just, just kind of one more thing. 
as we as we fade out here into the glory, what parting words, what nuggets of wisdom would you leave for the listeners today? Okay. Martial arts wise, go get your notebook and piece of paper or just listen to it on YouTube and rewind. Learn technique becomes instinctive reflex through repetition. Do it till you're sick and tired of it and then do it some more. Do what you love, love what you do, and if you can, do it for a living. Never let anyone say never. Never believe anyone who says never. That will never happen, or that attack never occurs, or that never. Never say never. Because every third blue moon on the equinox is going to happen. And then you're going to be going, what happened there? Uh, every rule's got an exception. Learn the rules. For me, tempo. Learn the laws, man. Learn the laws of motion. Learn the theories, concepts, and principles that make your body work. Ne- never let anyone tell you no. Uh, never let never let anyone inspire you to quit. Um, this is a lot of fun. Enjoy it. You know, the best thing I have is when students who train me quit, but keep doing the martial arts. That's the best thing in the world I can see as a person. Because even if they didn't like me, even if they didn't like my, the way my perspective or whatever, they're still doing the arts because they love the arts. That's what it's about. Do what you love. Ed Parker used to call me the Kempo nerd. But he gave me a very, as, as a joke, but he, but he said, Joe, what I love about you is your passion. Be passionate about what you do. And let that be shown to others by your actions. And uh, most important thing is never be afraid to ask a question. There are no dumb questions. There are no stupid questions. Nobody's stupid. You only feel stupid after you didn't ask the question and wish you had. And guess what? I do that all the time. I look at an instructor's picture and they're gone. And I can never ask them again. It's rare we have someone on the show who's both entertaining and insightful. Someone who can bring the degree of humor that Grandmaster Robello does and yet have substance behind it. I checked my notes and our first attempt to bring him on was actually several years ago. It took us a while to make this happen, but I'm quite okay with that because it was well worth the wait. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. And I appreciate all of you listening. If you want, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for all the links, photos, a bunch of great stuff that we talked about today. And of course, if you want to share this episode with someone, please do. Or, you know, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or whatever. Leave us a review. Those reviews help new people find the show. That helps the show grow helps us attract new guests, and then you get to listen to them. So in a way, it's kind of selfish for you to do that. But please, be selfish. If you want to find us on social media, we are at Whistlekick all over the place. And if you want to email me directly, best way, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I would love to hear from you. That's all I've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.